All right, uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, today is December 2nd, 2021. It's 11 a.m. Third. December 3rd, 2021. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, call this meeting to order. Um, today we're going to be talking about the future of the medical program um, in Vermont. Um, and before we get to the agenda, I'd like to just discuss a few administrative details. Um, a reminder that we pre-filed two of our rules with the Interagency Committee on Administrative Rules last Wednesday. Um, they're available on our website. They cover our application requirements for the various license types and our compliance and enforcement regulations. Um, I want to remind everyone listening that this is very much the starting line uh, of the rulemaking process, not the finish line. Um, we will continue to discuss these rules at our board meetings. We'll take comment on them, um, both from the administration, from the legislature, and from the public. And we have the ability to adjust them along the way. Um, we, we all know that every state that has gone before us has struggled with unintended consequences of well-intentioned regulations. And uh, we've tried our best to learn from these mistakes. Uh, of course, the best thing that you know, members of the public, people watching, people that are going to be impacted by these rules can do for us is to help us spot the places that might be overly burdensome, unnecessary, impossible to achieve, or just areas that we may have missed altogether. Um, we also, as a board, are probably going to have to start meeting a little bit more frequently over the coming weeks. Um, next week, the board's going to be meeting, um, the Cannabis Board will be meeting on Wednesday uh, at 11 a.m. likely, um, and Friday at 11. And then our exploratory subcommittee of our advisory committee is going to meet next Thursday at 11 to discuss um, some of the requirements that are in our January 15th report. Um, and when we have agendas finalized for those meetings, we will post them to our website, which again is ccb.vermont.gov. So before we turn to the agenda, anything to add, Julie, Kyle? No, thank you. Um, so I would, has it, have you had a chance to review the minutes mm -hmm. from 1123? All right, I would take a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, um, moving to the agenda. Um, so again, today we're discussing the future of the medical cannabis program in Vermont. Um, the medical registry um, is currently under the umbrella of the Department of Public Safety. Um, however, the Cannabis Control Board takes it over on January 1st, 2022. Um, under Act 164, um, the current statutes and regulations that control the program expire on March 1st, 2022. And we as a board need to um, recreate the regulations. Um, and we've been given two essential directives uh, on how to do that. One is that no new regulation we create can be more restrictive than the current regulations. And two, um, to the extent that we can, we need to aim to align our regulations um, with the adult use, um, the, the regulations for the medical program with the adult use recreational program. So before we as a board turn to discussing how the registry should change, um, I think it's really critical that we all understand what we have the authority to change versus what is set by statute um, and is squarely within the legislature's purview. Uh, I thought it'd be helpful for Bryn to walk us through some of these distinctions and then we'll turn to some of the specific recommendations that we received from our medical um, subcommittee of our advisory committee and then we'll just have an open discussion. Bryn, okay. you ready? Yep. Am I ready? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, Thank you for the introduction. I'm just going to talk about um, kind of a high level overview of the medical program and what exists in statute versus what exists in rule. And um, 
This is not a, an exhaustive list of what is in the rule and what's in the statute. It's really um, more of a list of the issues that have come up over and over again, both in the advisory committee, subcommittee, um, medical subcommittee, and also just in the public comment periods. So um, I just have a document here that kind of reviews uh, the high level of the program, what's in statute and what is in rule. And as um, as Pepper mentioned, there is um, statutes that are governing the program that are going away in March. Um, so they're the statutes that take effect, that are set to take effect in March, are a little bit different than the statutes that are going away. So there's a few different levels here. There is um, what is in statute as it is set to take effect in March, and then what is going away, and then specifically what, um, what the board has the authority to do in rule. Um, so we'll just start out with what's in the statutes as they're set to take effect in March. So first of all, and just as a reminder, what is in the statutes is um, what is within the legislature's purview to change. The board does not have the authority to uh, change what is set by statute. So first is the qualifying conditions for, um, for what type of condition can get a patient onto the registry. Um, there's a series of qualifying conditions that are set in statute, it's outlined here. Um, in subsection A, these are the various conditions or diseases um, that are qualifying. Subsection B is post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, subsection C is a disease or medical condition that's chronic, debilitating, and then produces one of um, a series of symptoms. So that's set by statute. The board does not have the authority to um, add conditions or change conditions um, without legislative action. <coughs> the second um, thing that's set by statute is the per patient cultivation limits. Um, so what is set in statute as they are set to take effect in March is a per patient cultivation limit of two mature and seven immature plants. Also the possession limits, the per patient possession limits um, is set to two ounces by statute. The requirement that caregivers um, have a criminal history record check that's fingerprint supported. Um, so a fingerprint supported criminal history record check that's both for Vermont, out of state, and also FBI records. That is a statutory requirement. The patient to caregiver ratio is set by statute at one to one. And also the required um, fee for an annual renewal of the registration for caregivers and patients. That is also a statutory requirement. So there are also some statutory provisions that do exist now, but don't exist um, once the new set of uh, statutes that govern the program take effect in March. So the first is a requirement that a patient has to designate a single dispensary that they can use. Um, the next is that bona fide healthcare professional patient relationship, which is, a, which is the requirement that there be a three month relationship between the patient and the caregiver or the healthcare professional. The limitation on dispensaries um, that they can only sell two ounces to a patient per patient per month. The definition of a registered caregiver is also going away. Um, the, new, the statutes that take effect in March still refer to caregivers, but there's not an associated definition for what a caregiver is. And then um, the limitation that there be only five dispensaries statewide unless the patient registry goes above 7,000. That is also disappearing. So this last short list here is, um, Again, the list of issues that, the, that have come up repeatedly um, in public comment and also in the medical subcommittee, um, that the board does have the authority to, um, to dictate and rule. Whether or not, uh, whether or not the dispensaries will um, provide out-of-state reciprocity, so if, um, if you're a patient out of state, if you can come and purchase as a patient in state, that's up to the board. Um, limitations on the number of people that a dispensary can serve uh, at one time. The amount that a dispensary can provide to a patient in a given time period. Um, and then again, a note that it is set by statute that a patient can't possess more than two ounces uh, at a time. 
And then lastly, the standards for denial of a caregiver card based on the criminal history record. So um, the criminal history record is required by statute, but what appears on that record, the board does have some authority to dictate whether or not a caregiver could get a card based on that record. So again, this is a high level overview of the, of the issues that have come up kind of over and over again as the medical program has been discussed and where the board has authority to make decisions and where um, the legislature needs to take action to change certain things. Okay, and Bryn, I know you asked me to tell you if there's anything missing from this list before the meeting. Um, I do have <laughs> one question, um, and maybe Lindsay can answer it, is we've heard a lot about um, third-party testing um, mm -hmm. for medical dispensaries. Yep. And I think that um, I have heard from the dispensaries that they are relying on a rule or a statute, I don't know which, as to that they can't share any of their samples with a, anyone, uh, anyone other than an other dispensary. So I'm not sure if that's a rule or a statute. And maybe Lindsay knows. We can look into it for I next time. I know it's in rule. It's in I rule. just am not 100% positive. Okay. It's because they are not allowed to um, dispense or give cannabis to anybody but a patient and caregiver okay. or another dispensary, which I believe is in the current statute. Okay. So I'll, um, we can just verify that. By the way, just for the record, that was Lindsay Wells, who uh, manages the Vermont Registry Program. Um, okay. I think um, that is very helpful. It's very helpful for all of us to know what we can do um, by rule and what we need um, to work with our partners in the legislature to accomplish. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. but, um, in the adult use side, we talked about training and education of staff. Is yes. that something we can do rules for the medical side as well? That is rule based, yes. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, qualifications and standards there can be done by rule. Okay. Yeah. So then why don't, um, before we really kind of dig into policy and discussions, why don't we look at what the medical subcommittee recommended to us. Um, and I can pull that up. I have some slides on that. And um, I can do some <laughs> supplemental <laughs> discussion. You can pull it further if you need to. leave it like this so I can kind of read my notes as well because um, this is they um, are working on a final report I'm looking at kind of a draft of the final report um, so I only put the kind of high-level recommendations here So just as a reminder, um, the medical subcommittee, um, the membership was Meg Delia. Uh, she was the representative from the Vermont Cannabis Trades Association. Jim Romanoff, who is the chair of the Marijuana for Symptom Re Relief Oversight Committee. I see a typo there. Uh, Matt Myers is the director of prevention services at the Department of Health. He was the designee for Dr. Levine. And so their first recommendation is really around continued access um, to products. Um, so I included the kind of paragraph in support of this, but essentially what this says is we need to ensure that the current Vermont patients have access to the medicine that they've relied on um, while we transition into adult use recreational. And the trade association um, has committed to maintaining a three month uh, supply, minimum supply of biomass for their patients based upon the previous three months of sales. And so that will include everything that's needed to make RSO, any of the kind of specialty products that um, are only available on the, uh, on the medical side. And, um, you know, this, uh, I think, 
we have required this um, in our rules as kind of a precondition of licensure for the integrated licensees to maintain this three month supply. And then the kind of secondary recommendation here um, under this heading is also to have us work with the trade association um, to continue to collect data on sales, inventory, and demand if the kind of you know, if we allow some other, these other um, kind of things to take shape and we have more patients or fewer patients, just keep a kind of close eye on, on the sales and inventory and demand throughout um, this transition to adult use. Um, second recommendation, um, remove the um, three month relationship requirement. Um, as Bryn just mentioned, this is actually not in the new statutes and so we don't have to do anything here. Um, this will disappear on its own. Um, you know, I think the, the, the original purpose behind the three month relationship really was to ensure that um, there wasn't kind of doctor shopping or kind of, um, you know, doctor's offices that would pop up just for the purposes of uh, handing out medical cards. Um, but I think there's probably sufficient evidence out there over the last 11 years that that's not, I don't think this is a real concern. Especially with the adult use market. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> um, remove the patient designation of dispensary requirement. Again, um, this is one that will go away. Um, it's not in the new set of statutes that were passed in uh, Act 164, so we don't have to necessarily decide to do this or not, it's just gonna go away. Um, remove the caregiver fingerprint requirement. Um, so just to think about caregivers, um, you know, these are people that have, that serve multiple functions, um, and we can pull up the definition if we'd like, but just from a very high level, they, um, they can go to the dispensaries on behalf of a patient who might be terminally ill or immobile, um, and um, they can also be a designated grower for a patient. Um, and so the, the, the fear of that this regulation is meant to address is really that, you know, a lot of the patients are very vulnerable um, and they could be get, get into a bad situation um, with a caregiver where, you know, they might try and exploit a vulnerable adult. You know, the idea is to try and make sure that caregivers are kind of, they don't have a a history of kind of um, harming vulnerable people. Um, the fingerprint requirement, um, you know, historically we've done um, background checks on caregivers and there have not been problems that have arisen from this relationship. Um, most, the vast majority of caregivers are spouses, parents, children of patients. Not to say that those people can't engage in kind of predatory behavior, but um, you know, I, I, to me, a fingerprint supported background check is a pretty um, arduous requirement uh, for a caregiver. And you know, the, the recommendation from the subcommittee is to get rid of it. We can still do a state background check, um, but the, the fingerprint really is about a 50 state background check with the FBI records. So. The recommendation was to remove it. Did that change with Act 164? Did something around fingerprints change with the new legislation? This, you can see the difference between the 18 VSA and the 7 VSA. Mm -hmm. So the 18 um, are the old um, requirements and the 7 are the ones that are supposed to take effect in March. So this is a new requirement. However, there was language in the old, legis in the old statutes around doing you know, criminal history yeah. background checks. So this is in some ways new, in some ways old. Okay. Um, public awareness. Um, so this is really, uh, the, the thought was is that the CCB licensees, the Medical Oversight Committee, healthcare professionals should be allowed to talk openly, more openly about the medical program. I think this kind of skirts the line between advertising and um, public awareness, you know, I, I, I think, um, I don't, the, the exact language is that the subcommittee recommends that the CCB allow licensees 
and healthcare providers to disseminate information to increase public awareness on the medical program. I don't, I don't really fully know what that means other than a lot of people don't know it exists, a lot of healthcare professionals don't know it exists, and that there should be some allowance to, for the CCB or the dispensaries to kind of promote themselves. Um, again, this, there's some interplay with our advertising mm -hmm. that we probably want to consider before we, when we talk about this in our discussion. Um, remove the three-person requirement, um, and I think what Bryn said is this goes away, or maybe not. Um, currently, I think it's either by rule or by statute that only three people can be at a dispensary at a time. The idea here is to um, ensure privacy. Um, you know, there's still stigma around cannabis, of course, and if you're at a, if you're a teacher or a healthcare professional. And you're also on the registry. You might not want to be in a place that's open to the general public um, to per to get your medicine. Mm -hmm. That's cannabis. Yeah, um, and I mean, <clears throat> with the way we decided to work with the integrated or folks keeping a retail license that currently operate a dispensary and not requiring a separate entrance necessarily, yeah. this is that would be kind of hard to practically. Yeah. Yeah, do right. Unless they can still ensure privacy in four or five people. Right. I mean, it depends on how the you know space is set up. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I'm just thinking they could. What if there's three? I don't know, I'm thinking of a scenario where there's three medical patients that come in, and there's a people waiting for adult use. Do they? kick everybody out, you know what I mean? So. You know, I think we, yeah, in rule, he said that you could have a uh, kind of reservation system or an yeah. appointment system, and you could do curbside. So I think we do have ways to kind of protect privacy of the patients that um, might have other things that they, you know, other issues going on. Yeah. So I think we I think we have dealt with this if we wanted to eliminate the three person requirement. No, and that's what I'm that's yeah. what I'm trying to say. I think it would be just judging by we put in a lot of parameters, but just this strict person count would be could be challenging to achieve or maintain mm -hmm. given the yeah. way that some of the dispensaries are currently set up. Yeah. Um, expand the definition of I mean, this is essentially expand the qualifying conditions. Um, specifically, um, the medical subcommittee wanted to include anxiety, sleep disorders, and any condition that um, would prompt the prescription of an opioid or a diagnosis of opioid use disorder. Um, there was a lot of discussion around adding, just eliminating the list of conditions altogether and just going whatever a doctor would re recommend. That fundamentally changes the way that the program works currently. Um, currently, doctors are not actually recommending the use of cannabis. They are merely, um, they're merely attesting that their patient has one of these listed conditions. So the, there is a fear that if you change fundamentally that a doctor has to recommend, because of the state of science in the United States and what's being taught at medical school is that no doctor might actually end up recommending cannabis. And you could see the um, patient decrease as opposed to increase. And again, this is strictly by statute. We don't have any authority to expand this in our own right or in our own regard. Um, so if we wanted to add things like anxiety, sleep, um, we would have to ask the legislature to do that, sleep disorders. Um, exempt certain conditions, um, and these are qualifying conditions or debilitating medical conditions from annual renewal requirement. This is really about increasing or decreasing the cost um, and decreasing the hurdles that patients that have chron or, uh, terminal um, or incurable diseases have to go through in order to stay on the registry. I mean, um, I think really it's kind of, there's only a handful of conditions that aren't lifelong that are debilitating medical conditions. And so why do those folks need to go for an annual renewal? Why do they need a, a letter from their doctor every single year saying, yes, I still have terminal cancer?
Expand the definition of possession limits and purchase caps. I think um, Bryn mentioned that the purchase caps do go away in the new legislation, um, and that's the two ounces per month. The possession limit really deals with the plant count, um, which, uh, as Bryn noted, was two mature, seven immature. And again, this is legislative, so we don't have the authority to kind of, with the stroke of a pen, change that. Uh, reciprocity, um, this would be allowing um, individuals with valid medical cards in other states um, come to Vermont and visit our dispensaries. Um, we can talk about that during the discussion. Um, the thought there was that this would increase the number of patients on the registry or that are participating and, you know, if there's increased um, scale on the patient side, then then they can provide cheaper products. Economy, they can, you know, leverage economies of scale to to provide cheaper products to the patients. Um, remove the application fee for patients. Um, really, the the medical fund um, has been in the black. It's been positive year after year, um, and a lot of people think that that. Um, that kind of overage surplus should be um, applied to either reducing application fees for patients or reducing them, reducing or removing. Um, so the medical subcommittee recommended redefining and expanding um, the definition of registered caregiver. And this is um, somewhat controversial in the subcommittee and um, the medical Oversight Committee has spent a lot of time dealing with this. Um, the kind of thought was from the, from the Oversight Committee is that you kind of bifurcate the definition. You say there's a caregiver that can, you know, go to the dispensary on a patient's behalf, can administer medicine on a, you know, to a patient. And then there's a separate kind of caregiver that's a designated grower. And so what the subcommittee, this, the subcommittee asked to buy for this bifurcation, and then they said, when it comes to purely kind of administering medicine or picking up medicine, that that should be an unlimited ratio. You know, one person should have as many caregivers as is necessary to kind of, you know, administer their medicine for them. But when it came to designated growers, that ratio should stay at one to one. Um, and so that's the kind of contours of this, of this um, recommendation. And I think that's it. They also, there's three other, um, there's four other recommendations that weren't all that well defined around data collection um, and in trying to increase research. Um, so I've asked for more information on those and you know, they don't require kind of rule changes, so we can kind of think about them separately when I get more information on them. And then just as a reminder, um, there is the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee. That committee is wrapped up in Title 18, so that committee, sorry, also um, will expire with the expiration of the statutes. Um, they were tasked, the medical, well, we are tasked with um, proposing an alternative to that, something to take its place. And, um, you know, the medical for, or Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee uh, met um, quite a few times and came up with this recommendation. It was contained in our November 1st report. So it's not new um, to any of us, but I figured I'd include it here just because I think it's really important that we are going to have a group, I mean, what is it, 12 people here that um, represent a vast majority of interests on the medical program, um, including patients and caregivers, healthcare professionals and cultivators um, that will be providing us continuous recommendations on how to improve the kind of, what you can see here, the ability of the patients um, to access um, the program, increase of affordability, um, make sure that uh, the dispensaries are actually serving the needs of the patients, 
and then also um, how to leverage any excess money um, that's in the fund, um, whether that should go towards serv improved services, products, um, educational opportunities, et cetera. So I wanted to just leave this up on the board as we move to our discussion of the future of the medical program, which is the um, vision, mission, mission, and, mission and vision statement that we created around the medical program, um, which is that we're going to try our best to ensure that patients and caregivers have continuity of access to the existing program services. We're going to endeavor to reduce the regulatory burden, um, increase safety and affordability of the medical program, uh, ensure that um, these are quality products, and that we have educational programs for healthcare professionals. So I just want to leave that up on the board because as we discuss things, I, I think it's important just to be able to refer back to this. So, um, let me just see where I am. So turning to kind of our discussion of the medical program, um, in advance of this meeting, I went back and watched our meeting um, on the medical program that we did, I think back in May. Um, a long time ago at this yeah. point, uh, but, um, and I was just reminded in watching that and hearing from the patients just how vital this program is, and yet at the same time how restrictive it is and how inaccessible it is to a large segment of patients, and how unaffordable it is to a large segment of patients as well. And of course, you know, it's our job to kind of start untangling that, that situation. Um, that being said, we have very strict timelines um, and we have these deadlines looming over us with the expiration of the statutes and the implementation of new rules um, and all the kind of uncertainty around bringing on an adult rec market um, while trying to maintain um, continuity of services. And I think my initial reaction to all of that is that we really need to be thinking about our task in two phases. Um, the first phase really to me would be to one achieve our immediate statutory duties which are to redraft the rules um, with those two directives you know no more restrictive than the current rules and aim to um, align our new regulations with the adult rec regulations and then um, the second um, which I think is also kind of contained in our mission and vision is really ensure that the current patients in this kind of onset of the adult rec market are um, held harmless um, by this kind of new profit mode of moving into the state and you know these new the dis current dispensaries being allowed to kind of participate in this new aspect of the market so on that second um, kind of ensuring that patients are held harmless I think that could mean you know ensuring continuity of products reducing waiving fees, um, reducing or waiving renewal requirements, patient caregiver ratios, et cetera. Um, and then with respect to kind of phase two, um, I think that's really where we need to reimagine the system and really think about systemic ways that we can improve access, affordability, and quality. And um, I know that one issue that gets brought up quite a bit is having a kind of patient caregiver co-op um, dispensary. Um, you know, I, I think that should be on the table for our exploratory committee next week. Um, I think, uh, I mean, we can do a lot to kind of think about ways to really attack the kind of accessibility and affordability and quality of the program. But I think we should move to kind of a discussion of some of these specifics and um, these specific recommendations and think about the direction that we want to go as a board. So um, I'm happy to take any advice on whether you think phase one, phase two approach makes sense. Um, and if so, what should be part of phase one? I'm happy to, um, you know, further Kind of discuss my thoughts on on that, mm -hmm. um, but you know, we should have a little bit of an open discussion about the whole thing. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that the meeting our statutory requirement and making sure the rules are up to date. 
um, and consistent where they need to be with the adult use is a good phase one. And then phase two, I think, is really, like you said, reimagining the system yeah. so that it works well for everyone. Yeah, I agree. I think that makes sense. Yeah. I want folks to feel like they're left behind. I think, you know, as I look at these recommendations on the whole, I think they, they move the program, they move the needle. Um, there's some stuff that I, I want more information into the thought process on from the medical subcommittee and also to hear, I mean, we've heard a lot about, and I'm thinking specifically, again, around this caregiver conversation, and I've said publicly in meetings that I think the ratio needs to move off of a one to one ratio. I think I've said that. I don't want to put words in your mouth, Julie. I think you have said that as well. And so, and you know, quite honestly, the optics of the subcommittee don't do it any favors as to understanding why they don't want to move the cultivation side of caregiving off that one to one ratio. So I didn't know if if you recall any of their thoughts yeah. as to why that shouldn't move. Because we hear a lot, or at least I've heard a lot, you know, there's a lot of really great caregivers who can grow for medical purposes in this state that are registered, what happens if something does go wrong, like it does from time to time with everybody from a grow up perspective, that there is some type of, you know, um, pest issue, whatever the case may be, that, that loses that patient the ability to have that kind of same relationship with a caregiver. Why can't they receive product from more than one caregiver? Why can't one caregiver you know, provide product to more than one patient. I'm, I'm really just at a mental block as to why that's, why that's not a good idea. I mean, the conversation that I heard really was around you're creating essentially, you have your regulated market where people are getting licenses, they're subject to testing requirements, they're um, subject to kind of getting licenses around retail. And then if you allow this kind of expansive, you know, patient to caregiver ratio, you're essentially saying, because the caregivers won't be subject to those. I mean, we right. do. Yeah. Then all of a sudden you're having a caregiver for potentially, I don't know, the, the number that I hear is one to five. So five patients, let's just use that as an example. Five patients that can grow, you know, 10, I guess 10 mature and, you know, 35 immature plants and they're outside of any sort of real regulation. So none of the testing, none of the kind of um, product safety, consumer safety issues are involved. And you know, they're not paying a fee for this, they're not paying taxes on it, they're, um, they're really just kind of an unregulated piece of our regulated market. Right. And so, you know, I agree, um, with, with some of that, because when, like, my whole thinking is that when these things start entering the chain of commerce, that's when it turns into a consumer safety issue, when, when these cannabis products. And that's when we really need to, we have a responsibility as a board to take care of our most vulnerable, the most vulnerable as the consumers of, the, of this product. So I don't have a problem with increasing the patient to caregiver ratio. I do think that that will trigger us to create regulations around uh, additional quality control regulations around what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I think if we go too high, then we run we run the the risk of quality kind of taking a dip. I think it's it's no no matter if it's cannabis or anything else, you can be really good at doing something in a small batch. That doesn't necessarily mean your skills translate to doing it at scale, and that's just the way that it, it takes time, it's a learning curve, right? I think if we go too high on that ratio count, we could run into problems. But I also fear, you know, the narratives out there that we're not gonna be able to change, at least initially, is that there's people that just don't, frankly, trust the dispensaries for one reason or another. So if they can't get their product from a registered caregiver, are they gonna turn to the, to the illicit market or are they gonna go to the dispensaries to get their product? In that situation, I'd rather just raise the, the caregiver count at least you know off the one-to-one -one ratio I don't I don't necessarily have a magic number in my head at this moment in time I'd love to hear you know comment on it or have more discussion on it but I, I'd rather them be able to go to somebody else that is least has at least come forward to us and registered versus you know getting it from somebody who um, has not taken those steps to to show that they're not trying to you know pull a fast one on uh, somebody who's part of the sensitive part of our community to your thought, um, Kyle, about you know what will somebody do if there's not if they can't get enough or get the right thing from their caregiver, is it within our purview to say whether or not people can use their medical cards at adult use? 
retail establishments without tax, or is that something that the legislature would have to determine? You know, I don't know the answer to that, but because there are, because there are, I mean, I, I think it would depend on how much we expand the registry or allow loosening of the, like, on ramps into the registry, because then there are kind of general fund implications for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the legislature would say that it's in their authority, um, but I don't know for sure. Because it, it could be one possible solution to the problem that you're presenting, right? Yep. No, and, and, and again, the optics of the subcommittee and their makeup do not do that one, keeping that one to one ratio any favors regardless of the merits of that recommendation and that's just the reality of it so i just wanted to understand a little bit more as to why versus yeah you can let caregivers come to us and get product for people but you know, we're we're not suggesting that you can do more without us being part of the system you know what i mean mm -hmm. so i just wanted to and, and all your points as to why that decision was likely made made logical sense yeah but in the in the you know, in the mission of trying to keep continu continuity and allowing folks to get this on their terms versus our terms from a certain perspective, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that ratio adjusting it might be, you know, better for everybody. Now you feel like <coughs> yeah, I think we need to adjust the ratio. Yeah. Or should adjust the ratio. Yeah. And I don't have a magic number in my head. No. I think if we go too high, it's testing's going to have to happen or something along yeah. those lines and there's going to be more quality control. Yeah. But at some point you're creating another small business, right? So they'd have to think, I think this is a right. phase two conversation, right? But it's kind of how I feel. If yeah. we go above anything beyond like one to one to two, that we should really think about having a cultivation tier that's specific right. to medical, like a 25 plant or something like that, that is, or 50 plant mm -hmm. that is specific to medical and it's subject to the regulations of the dollar rent market. Um, and then that kind of, you can't have that conversation without then thinking about, well, should we then also have a medical co-op, you know, where mm -hmm. a lot of growers can then, you know, centralize their product and, you know, have some shared resources. Yeah. Um, and should that be subsidized by the cannabis fund? I mean, these, these issues for me are all interrelated. That's true. Yeah. Well, what else do you think we should do with respect to, um, my broad bucket, which is ensuring that current patients are held harmless. Um, we have the, by the onset of adult rec, mm -hmm. I should finish my sentence there. Um, and just to be absolutely clear about what I mean is that the dispensaries are allowed to sell their medical products on the, in the through their, the kind of non prohibitive ones on the adult rec market. Um, and so we need to make sure that the patient, the current Vermont patients that are relying on those products are not going to show up and, you know, someone on the adult rec side has cleaned out the shelves. Right. And, I think that uh, was kind of my question yeah. about the use of the medical card at any retail location right. with the tax benefit, right? right. Because the, when you're purchasing medical cannabis, you're not paying the, the, any taxes right. on it, right? No sales tax, right? No excise tax. So. I mean, allowing people to purchase anywhere with a medical card, yeah. um, you know, means that they might be able to get it closer to their home. Right. right now, we only have, I think, five or six locations in Vermont. They're not necessarily spread out evenly, geographically evenly. So it would allow people to be able to have more access. Um, and should there be an issue with a medical crop or something happens to one of those businesses, there's still other options for yep. those patients. Maybe not for some of the specialty products, right? That's right? The only but problem, for of course. Yeah. I'm not quite sure how what their I think their top selling products are the flour and sort of the cartridges, right? So it yeah. may not those might be specialty products, so the impact might be less, yeah. right? <clears throat> if there's an issue. Um, and I think that is the three month. I mean, we have all kind of agreed to that already. The three month supply is we think that that's satisfactory. How, what does that um, do in terms of like the production of a product? So it's three months of biomass, but not, not necessarily like finished product, right? That's right. Um, so there is, the, I mean, that's an issue that was raised that, you know, if I need some specialty concentrate, maybe it won't be ready on the day that I need it. So I think that there is, 
you know, I think most people that use those are pretty consistent with their purchasing habits because they yeah. treat it like medicine. And so I think the, the dispensaries are gonna be, I think that was part of that data, ongoing data requirement is to make sure that the dispensaries can anticipate the kind of purchasing habits of their patients yeah. and make sure that the products are ready and available for them uh, when, they, when they ask for them. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm talking all the time. So back. Okay. No, no, please. Uh, so back to this, um, and I don't know if David or Brent have looked this question up since you brought it up, but the testing requirement being in statute or rule um, for the, the medical dispensaries needing to test from at other dispensaries versus third party labs, is that something we would have an ability to do? So there is a, there is a requirement in the statute, the statutes that take effect in March. Um, actually I think they're in effect right now, that everybody has to have independent testing. There, there has been a question that's come up um, about whether that applies to the integrated licensees, but there is a statutory provision that provides that it applies to everybody. And I can find it if you would need it. Yeah. And it applies to the dispensaries as well? It does, yes. Um, it does. And there's no conflict there? I mean, I know we're, we're not clear on whether or not it's by statute or by rule, but there's no conflict with the and dispensaries can only share products with patients and other dispensaries. Right, and that, I'm not sure if that is in rule. I do not, I haven't seen yeah. that um, in statute, but um, okay. I can, we can find out where it is and let you know. I just, if we can allow dispensaries to use, utilize third party testing, I think it could unlock some bottlenecks at dispensaries, but also give Try and try and get back some trust that may have been lost from the public with dispensaries by yeah. by using third party testing. Yeah. To the extent that we're able to. Yeah. It's seven BSA nine oh eight F is the requirement that cannabis products have to be tested by an independent licensed testing laboratory. Mm -hmm. So what do we think about the annual renewal for people with incurable conditions? What is the current cost? Is it fifty dollars for the card only or is it is it is there another fee? So Lindsay, I think it's fifty dollars annual, right, for the card? Correct. And then you would have to pay whatever your doctor requires for the doctor's right. visit to certify, right? Right. Uh, well, a lot of them would build the insurance because, you know, if you're going to your oncologist right. for a regular checkup or whatever, right. Right. they build the insurance for that. Insurance won't cover, you know, um, Dr. Pot, right. <laughs> you know, right. that, that's the only service that he's like providing is yeah. the Was there any discussion service. about that insurance in the set? No, I said you know, that this is um, about insurance or workers' comp reimbursements. In the subcommittee? There was not. Of course, uh, it's a tricky subject <laughs> to unpack. Whether there should be, I think New Jersey has a, yeah. a company that will insure people for medical yeah. marijuana. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, I don't, yeah. I think it would have to be in state. Yes, yeah. I think so too. I'm just throwing it out there on my wish list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think it makes sense to waive the annual renewal for incurable diseases? Yeah. Do we want to distinguish which of these diseases from the just conditions? Can we go back to the list? Yeah. 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 I'm trying, I think that there aren't very many on there that are curable, right? They were mostly long-term. It's gonna take me a second, because I, I didn't put out the list, but I, Oh, wait, I think it's on the document Brent sent me. <laughs> Slowly but surely. <laughs> okay. Is it on here, Brent? Oh, there it's right there. Yep. So, when it comes to the kind of it seems crazy for us to just have a subset of these 
I think the only one that has ever really given anyone any sort of problem in the legislature is the chronic pain. I, re I really think that's the one where people say, well, that's by definition, you know, not incurable. I think the definition is like sustained pain for three months or longer or something like that. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know. Usually chronic pain comes with something else. Yeah. Right. It's not, it doesn't generally just stand alone. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, maybe we can just have a longer discussion about this. Yeah. Um, but I think my recommendation would be we kind of have some sort of reduced um, application and fee requirements for for all of these except for chronic pain. Yeah, uh, and I'm, that makes sense. I'm just thinking like, you know, I have trouble getting in to see a doctor. I mean, maybe it's because I don't have any of these de debilitating no, physical right or mental so, issues, yeah. but you know, getting in to see a doctor every year and for folks that may be suffering from one of these, it, might not be easy to get to your doctor physically, you know yeah. what I mean? So, does chronic pain have to be every year? I mean, generally, if you have chronic pain, like I said, it comes from something else, like yeah. you have a long term injury or you right. have some other illness. Like, I don't even know if you would need to do that every year, maybe right. every two years. I don't right. know if we can make that change. I think we can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's fiscal impacts to this, but again, like the program has been running a deficit or a uh, positive yeah. in the positive for so many years that mm -hmm. we should really, I think, maybe dig into maybe a little bit of the financing to see what the fiscal impact would be. And, and there's, but I, uh, I do think that, you know, someone with Parkinson's isn't gonna just one day wake up and the Parkinson's is gonna yeah. be gone. You know, I, to me, having, a, having that, have to have an annual renewal just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, My only other sort of devil's advocate thought is if we don't change that and people still have to renew every year and pay the fee every year we could have a plan for what to do with those funds that's useful to the patients whether right. it's some sort of medical education or education for medical providers or something like that right well I guess that ties into my other question which is should we just propose a reduced fee period for, for everyone just 50, $50 now let's just cut it in half something yeah. and again like it speaks to the issue you just raised which yeah. is if there if there is extra money maybe we can use it for something that benefits patients or benefits the program but I also don't think you know this is the type of fee yeah. that should be set at exactly what it needs to be to right. cover the costs I guess my only like overarching thought is is it the fee that's the that could be the issue or is it the process and the physical having to go see your doctor that's the more of the issue if it's a $50 annual fee that doesn't again I mean $50 means something different to everybody right but yeah. it doesn't seem like it's overly burdensome necessarily more so than the the, the paperwork the visit the everything that goes along with going to your doctor seems like it might be the, the higher hurdle to right to get over from so maybe there's lowering the fee and you know, reducing the, the number of requirement. times, yeah, yeah, number of times that you have to to renew. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's every two years, you know, for yeah. for for chronic pain or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I do believe just I know this is a side point, but I do believe that you know there's certain requirements on which types of doctors and where those doctors can be located. I think they allow doctors in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, and New York, but they and but they also allow telemedicine um, mm -hmm. for those doctors as well. I think. Um, all right, what about, so if, if we just, I saw something on your, on your list right here, um, if we're going back to the caregiver, I think it's what, two mature plans and seven immature plans for patients. Yep. I think if we are interested in raising that ratio, we would have to look at raising that, ah, I guess I don't know. Again, I'm worried about crop failures right. that are at no fault of the very, you know, expert growers that we have in the caregiver program. 
do we need to raise those? Yeah. Those at all? Even if we leave it at one to one, do we need to raise it? At all? I mean, I do sort of think that you know this was written several years ago, right? And a lot has changed, and some of the you know fears perhaps that were you know addressed or problems that we thought were going to occur when this was originally written, maybe they didn't didn't well out. And I don't know that we need to be as concerned about patients growing for themselves three or four plants, you know, having three or four mature plants at one time. If they need it for themselves, they're not. And they're going to have an adult use market. Yes. And since then, you can now, you know, you can grow and give it away to your friends. Yeah. And I know we've had these discussions and heard from folks, members of the public, on their thoughts on specific numbers, if they're going to be adjusted, and I don't have all of those numbers in my head. I guess I'm saying I'm, I'm open to the conversation of raising them. Do I have the magic numbers off the top of my head at this moment in time? No. <laughs> but, you know, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, you can't separate this conversation from the patient and caregiver conversation, which we have not, but I just want to make sure right. that that's clear. Um, because there is a fear, and I've seen this play out in the legislature over and over again, that when you expand either care, patient caregiver or plant cows, that you get into the situation where, you know, people aren't really thinking about crop failures or, you know, things like that. They're thinking that these folks are trying to skirt the regulated market. Um, and so, while I don't necessarily agree with that, I think that because this is statutory, um, I we, it was statutory. Yeah, we need to really think about where we want to kind of put our, I mean, we can make the recommendation, of course, but, you know, I, I think that we are less, we are more likely to lose on both than, than if, we, if we recommend both than if we kind of aim our kind of recommendation at increasing one or the other. You're suggesting that we pick our arguments, yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it was a very concise way to put what I said, yes. I understand what you're saying, and it's, there's a lot of track buckets to keep in our head, and I'm sure everybody's head on what we have immediate control over, what we need to make recommendations on, and what we'll have control over sometime in the future. I'm sure we'll hear public comment on what is most important, and that will be helpful in terms of yeah. deciding which of those things are right. most important for us to put on. And just, yeah, just going back to the May 24th meeting, and, you know, we did hear that, um, that the two, to, two and seven was inadequate. Um, we heard that over and over again, mm -hmm. actually, um, from patients. Um, you know, Eric St. Croix, I don't know if you remember him, he was caregiving for a very young mm -hmm. child, and he said the two and seven was not enough. And that was in addition to buying two ounces from the dispensaries, growing the plants, and then having to supplement from the illicit market. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to that. I just, I have a feeling that we might lose everything if we try and change too much in this kind of phase one. Um, how about the fingerprint requirement? That goes away, right? So we actually, or no, that's no, not, that, that does not go out. away. Yes, that Make starts out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I uh, feel very comfortable removing this just as a baseline. Um, we, again, can still do Vermont supported background checks, you know, in-state background checks if we want to. Um, I don't think that there's ever been an issue on the uh, on the caregiver side to date. Um, I won't ask you that because it's probably confidential. Um, but, uh, you know, just given the close relationship, and if we recommend increasing one to two, I, I don't feel like that should trigger any sort of fingerprinting requirement either. And that's a <clears throat> legislative, we're making a recommendation to the legislature, right? That's not in the rule, that's in the statute. We would have to ask for that to be removed. I agree. I think it's it adds a burden that's unnecessary. Yeah. There is an adult abuse registry as well, um, that if we could ensure that we have access to that as well, or someone could do a check on that, then maybe that would kind of really 
be a backstop. Backstop mm -hmm. to just getting rid of this. Mm -hmm. Is that like folks that have taken advantage of senior citizens? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's. Oh, the elder abuse. Elder abuse registry. Yeah, yeah. yeah that exists. Is it just elder abuse, or is it any vulnerable adult? I, I think you're right. It's vulnerable adult. Yeah. Is that something you think we get access? That we as a board we get access to? We would need authority. Yeah, yeah, I think you'd need. You'd, that's probably also a statutory fix. Okay. Okay. I think that's the main reason for this. I don't think. I know that. Um, you know, there's certain disqualifying crimes in the current statutes um, that we probably are going to loosen up a little bit. I think you know certain drug offenses are disqualifying for caregivers, but you know we can have that conversation. Um, I think we would probably just follow the rules that we have for mm -hmm. adult rec on disqualifying crimes and apply that to caregivers. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Um, what else do we have here? So debilitating medical conditions, um, obviously this has every single time a new one gets added, it's a multi-year process. Um, and it usually takes a, a lot of witnesses coming in and saying why this is important. It becomes very political very quickly. Um, so while I really do I really do like the, the path that a lot of states, or a handful of states have done, which is if you're gonna prescribe an opiate, then you also automatically, you know, are eligible to be on the registry. Um, I think that that could get, go down a path of us having to really show science that opiates, good science, that, op that cannabis is a substitute for opiates. I think we would need to have very strong kind of, um, you know, evidence-based reports on that. And I just, I know that they're starting to mm -hmm. come online, those kind of longitudinal studies, but they're just not at a point where I think the legislature is willing to kind of make that, take that uh, as kind of gospel, I guess. It just seems like we've heard from so many people who have, we have. have successfully moved from opiates to cannabis. Um, or have been completely clean after moving from opiates to cannabis. Like I just you did on Tuesday night. Yeah. Well, I mean that's what I'm talking about. It just seems like we've heard from so many people, both in who are willing to comment it publicly and people who've told us, I think, personally and privately. Right. So um, I, I don't know. I um, that one is the one I think is the most important to add, really. And it would would it be if you're getting prescribed an opiate? Um, or would it be? I'm thinking more about um, substance abuse. Substance moving use away, disorder? Yeah, substance use disorder. Like moving away from using okay. opiates. But, I mean, both. I guess I would agree with both. Yeah. And do, you know, I just don't know if that's an actual medical diagnosis. We could find that out. Mm -hmm. Like, if a doctor's willing to kind of say this person has opiate use disorder, uh, it yeah. sounds like an official medical condition. Yeah. But, because again, it's going to have to rely on a doctor verifying that this condition is present. Yeah. And then there's, the, of course, the you know, the other factor is like, does this apply if you have opiate use disorder and you're under 18 or under 21? Is it the same as if you're over 21? I don't know. I mean, we had deaths in Chittenden County of kids who were under 18. I know. You know, that could have been yeah. avoided. Like, that's where, I mean, that's where the, you know, there are people at the other end of this piece yeah. of me goes, you know. Yeah. I was just, and I know this isn't kind of our yeah. problem to solve, and it kind of ties into number five, but I remember on our May 24th meeting, we were hearing from patients whose doctors were not willing to sign the papers for, for people that were under 21, yeah. even if they had one of these qualifying conditions. Yeah.
I mean, that you're right. I think that's a bigger problem than we can solve. Right? Right. But if at least we could um, include opiate use disorder if it is a condition. Yeah. Um, and how do we feel about sleep and anxiety? Sleep disorders and anxiety. I would just say, historically, it's been a non-starter. But maybe in this new world we live in. I, you know, I just feel like Again, we got to kind of focus on what we can achieve. This yeah. just, and we have to kind of push everything through the lens of aligning with the adult rec program, no more restrictive than current, and how do we protect patients during this time? I think those are the kind of three pillars of the arguments we can make to the legislature that hold a, a lot of kind of, you know, goodwill. Mm -hmm. um, and so, we try and go too far beyond that and we don't have we can't rely back you know fall back on those justifications that we're not going to be very successful on these more kind of contentious issues no, I think that makes sense I worry that the legislature might just say for sleep disorders and anxiety why can't they just go buy it on the right. red market and how much do you need right. I, I versus guess us taking if we're the, picking the our battles I think I care more about the opioid issue that we have than me too say anything against the medical conditions of anxiety or sleep disorders by any stretch, but <clears throat> recognizing all points. And there definitely could be some interplay between those, right? right? Um, reciprocity. Um, reciprocity, to me, makes sense. Up until we decided to co-mingle the, um, the uh, canopy for the dispens the dispensaries and the integrated licenses. You know, the, the whole idea that why people are asking for reciprocity um, is really one, um, you know, the dispensaries wanted it because then they have a whole new patient base. But if their canopy is gonna be kind of fixed and it's gonna be intermingled, then it doesn't really matter whether they're selling their I mean, as long as they maintain sufficient supply for their patients, it doesn't really matter whether they're selling more to out-of-state or in-state patients, or out-of-state mm -hmm. patients or adult rec customers. So that kind of, to me, eliminates the argument that they're making in favor of reciprocity, at least in this early phase. And the downside that I see to reciprocity really is that it continues to erode that three-month supply. Mm -hmm. that's set aside for Vermont patients. Um, you know, someone from out of state is coming in, buying tax-free for something that's been set aside for a Vermont patient. And, you know, the, you know, the tax revenue that's being generated from the adult rec sale is being reinvested in Vermont. I mean, so it again kind of eliminates that revenue source for programs, prevention programs, after-school programs, and whatever else the money gets spent on. So to me, I don't, like reciprocity, it's nice for people that have second homes um, in Vermont that are patients elsewhere, but I just, that, to me, this isn't the, a top of my priority once we made that decision to allow the dispensaries to kind of commingle their inventory. Mm -hmm. So just because <clears throat> it's lost in, in my, my mind because reciprocity to me means somebody can come do something here I can go do something there right like I, you know what I mean so yeah. and I don't know maybe this is a question for Lindsay sorry to keep putting Lindsay on the spot can can folks and I know we might not have any control over this given we don't have any jurisdiction beyond the borders of Vermont but can a medical patient from Vermont go to another state that has a medical program? If their state allows it. If yeah. their state okay. allows it. And it's not yeah. contingent upon us having reciprocity right. with okay. them. It's that no. was my yeah. big question. Reciprocity may not be the right word because yeah, it's, it's really not. I'm thinking in terms of my Yeah, right. Because yeah. <laughs> <Right. So, laughs> yeah. um, that would be my, my bigger concern here versus your, your points where I'd like to, I understand, I mean, I'd like to hear public comment on you know, folks coming here, more public comment on folks coming here and using their medical cards, but recognizing that tax revenue will stay in Vermont and be reinvested into Vermont versus 
having tax free cannabis for folks that are not Vermont residents or not on the Vermont re medical registry. You know, I think that that makes sense. But reciprocity is on our rules list, not our legislative requests, right? I think that's right. Yeah. And so reciprocity also, you know, from a patient side, you have anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's that's a qualifying condition in Maine. You go to Maine, get your car there, and then come purchase here in Vermont. I mean, you know, it's a way to kind of loosen the program without actually having to kind of go through all these legislative steps. Um, so there are there are benefits to it. You know, I, I think there are patient benefits to it. Um, but again, this this just I think you know is not high on my list of things that we need to do in phase one when we're literally just trying to make sure the patients are remain remain whole. Mm -hmm. The current patients that have rely that have come to rely on these medicines. This so, is like an expansion of the program pretty significantly. Yes. And if it's done by rule that means that we have a little bit more control over when it happens. Right. Right. So if we decide we need to move on it then we can. Right. I mean if you look at our, our mission which is to maintain the integrity of Vermont patients and the Vermont medical program. I don't know if this does rise to the, the top of the priority sheet, just given that, mm -hmm. that mission itself. How about the redefinition of registered caregiver? I know we talked about expansion of the ratio, um, but do we want this bifurcation? I know that I can't quite remember the reasoning, but I know that um, Vermont patients um, Association, Amelia and Jesse Lynn and, uh, and Jeffrey and others really did not want this bifurcation to happen. Um, and I, I just wonder if their rationale changes or if anyone's rationale changes. If we are expanding the designated grower to one to two and then having an unlimited number of these other types of caregivers that are administering um, the products to, you know, a terminal patient. And again, just um, they actually, the legislature a few years back did expand the, the ratio of registered caregiver. They didn't do this bifurcation for um, children under 18, mm -hmm. just because sometimes they're living in two homes and they need two different caregivers. So there is a recognition at the legislature that some people might need kind of more around the clock or kind of more access to people that can help administer uh, the medicine. But for, I just want to make sure I understand. So for children under 18, um, like the gentleman that, that testified to us, he was growing, right? But then that child potentially has two parents. Would they have three caregivers? No. Two so he, he had, just because I watched the video again, yeah. he actually had to give up his caregiver card, his caregiver authority to dad um, at a certain point okay. when dad, when they kind of had two houses. Okay. So... And does that mean he cannot? So he couldn't do anything legally for that patient anymore. anymore. Yeah. Okay. But I think that patient also stopped using. He was. Right. I mean, we don't have to go into the details. Well, but just as a yes. for instance, there yes. is a, a pretty easy scenario where someone might need more three. than two or yeah. three. Yeah. Is it going to be confusing to people if we have two separate? It will be confusing. Yeah. Yes. Definitions of the word caregiver. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to hear more public comment on it before I kind of. Yeah. I would rather increase the caregiver, you know, advocate for increasing the caregiver number than just leave the definition yeah. alone and increase yes. the, the overall ratio. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm not sure. Maybe somebody in the audience will give us some thoughts on that. Yeah. Brynn, is there anything that we're missing that you and I have been talking about or that you can remember um, from the any of the subcommittee hearings or anything that, that I missed on this kind of immediate phase one needs. Did you talk about the amount that a dispensary can provide to a patient at any uh, given time? Did you? No. Oh, at, at any given time or on a monthly? On a monthly, you know, the, yeah. that require that two ounce limitation per month yes. goes away. Right. So. Yes, and that's right here. Purchase caps, right? Uh, so, um, right, I think the purchase caps, two ounces per month, I think, you know, that should just go by the wayside. We should just peg whatever purchase caps we have on the adult rec side to the medical side, just in keeping with that kind of 
directive. Should we leave it for products that are specific to the dispensary or have a, a certain amount? I don't want people to buy products at the dispensary that can only be purchased there, the specialty products, and then, and then ha have an opportunity to move them into the OSM market. The OSM market yeah. Well, it's interesting because I don't actually think that, you know, one thing that we heard over and over again is that there's no like comparables chart, so like mm -hmm. two ounce limit also means two ounces of concentrates, which is much more than two ounces worth of flour, right. you know. Um, um, so, I don't know about the answer to that. Um, why don't we focus right now first yeah. on the easier question as to the per visit. Oh yeah, I don't think there needs to be, you mean the per month limit? Let's do just like per visit, so okay. per, per transaction. Which I think on the adult rec side we said one ounce, or the statute says the one statute. ounce per visit. Mm -hmm. And the statute says two ounces for patients. Yeah. For patients. So I'm fine with two ounces. It puts them in a little bit of legal limbo with kind of an overzealous police officer who might want to pull you over and say, why do you have two ounces? It's a civil violation. The likelihood of that happening is probably pretty minimal. So we could do two ounces per visit. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and then how about month, any monthly caps that we care about? No. no. Okay. Except for products that are prohibited on the adult rec market, or is that overly prescriptive? Are we getting too, like... Well, I, I don't think it's overly prescriptive for now. I know that we've recommended some changes to the adult use market, so maybe it doesn't make yeah. sense to do that. But. Well, you know, those, are the, those actually are the products that I'm most concerned about mm -hmm. because the patients can't get those other places, and if, someone, if they've got a three-month supply set aside for the remote patients, and, you know, one patient says, well, I might just buy a year supply right now um, just so I don't have to come back to this dispensary for the entire year. And then that wipes out that entire three month supply for the entire registry. Maybe it makes sense. Yeah, I, yeah, that's concerning. I don't think people should be able to walk out <laughs> with a truck of. <laughs> so it, it does tie into the question about do we want to get into a, a comparables chart or like kind of a, uh, like how much. How much of? I think we heard from the dispensaries that they would like a comparables chart. As long as I'm not responsible for that math, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And that <laughs> probably exists somewhere. Yeah, I'm sure we know some folks that can help us out on that. Right. I do not want to be responsible for that math. <laughs> so why don't we think a little bit more about this and give you a recommendation, Bren, okay. for, for next week. Okay. <laughs> Does that sound all right? Yes, I hope some other state has a nice chart that you can but I, follow. But I think the basic okay. thing is, if it's prohibited on, if it's a prohibited product in the adult rec side, that there should be some sort of monthly purchase cap? Yes, I think that's what we're saying. Yeah. Okay. I think that makes sense. Okay. Okay, so why don't I, why don't I bring a comparables chart to the next meeting? Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. All right. And we'll probably need that for the adult rec side anyway, right? Do you remember anything else from uh, just any of our conversations that we haven't discussed? Um, I, from what I heard the you all discussing, I think you hit it all. Okay. Anything else that you, either of you think that we need to kind of think about for a phase one kind of overall? Not at this point. No. Okay. Maybe some some comments. I'm sure we'll hear some of that next. Mm -hmm. Days. Do we want to think about a phase two right now, or should we kind of just keep our eyes set on what our most immediate goals are? I think we should do the most immediate goals. Okay. Right, because we have rules. You have rules to write. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we being the royal we. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then um, that's the end of our agenda, other than public comment. Um, so why don't we go ahead and move to public comment? Um, let me just uh, get rid of this screen share. Um, so if you've uh, joined by the link and you'd like to make a public comment, please 
we'll start with the people that joined by the link. Please raise your virtual hand. Oh, why don't we start with the people that are uh, that joined us at our physical location? I don't have any comments at this point. Okay. Okay. Well, then we'll start with we'll move to the people on the list uh, that joined by the link, and then we'll move to the people that joined by a phone. Um, so we have Amelia first. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hey, Amelia. Um, so I have a few thoughts, but I'll try to keep it quick. Um, first, just responding to the most recent thing that uh, gave me pause. No, after hearing all of this, I still do not support okay. bifurcating the definition of a caregiver. Um, I don't think that that is going to help patients. I don't think that that is going to help caregivers. I think that that's just going to create unnecessary confusion. And I think that even if we allow two caregivers per patient and we up the patient plant counts, it's it's unnecessary to bifurcate the definition of caregiver. My solution or my suggestion, I would say, to kind of helping with this caregiver quandary and the patient to caregiver ratio, et cetera. Um, I briefly spoke about it the other night during the public comment meeting, uh, but I've had a few days to kind of get my thoughts together about it and talk to Jeffrey, um, who just kind of helped me solidify what I'm thinking of. I would like to propose an additional medical license type that can be made available to somebody with a pre-existing license. And this license would allow somebody who already has, you know, one of the uh, grow licenses to provide for up to five patients. It would increase their plant count per patient. And they would be able to either sell at a, at a much lower cost than the dispensaries or give for free medicine to the patients. And that is how I see us not creating an unnecessary regulatory burden on existing caregivers, and we don't have to change the existing definition of a caregiver. Amelia, can I ask you a quick qualifying question? When you said somebody who already has a license, are you referring to somebody who has a caregiver license, or are you thinking somebody who might have an adult use cultivation license somewhere down the road that might be able to get a supplemental license to then sell as a caregiver from their, their adult thinking, use cultivation license? I'm thinking a supplemental mm -hmm. license to the adult use licenses, which I feel like, you know, given that one of your missions is that you want to keep adult use in mind as much as possible as you move forward with this medical regulation. I think that makes sense to me. Um, and I know that part of part of the discussion around all this and part of the confusion is how are we going to expand the caregiver patient ratio while also keeping in mind patient safety, quality control, all of these things. If we look at what is being proposed for these adult use cultivation licenses, there's already regulations in place for safety, for testing, for your environment. And those places, in my opinion, are, are the safest environments for us to be then handing over patients to be, um, you know, cared for and grown for. So that that's just my thought. It's not fully fleshed out. It's something I've only just thought about in the last couple of weeks, but I think it is a really good solution to giving patients greater access to caregivers giving caregivers greater access to patients by upping that ratio and ensuring product safety and product quality all at the same time. And we have so many adult use licenses, but we only have like two different medical licenses. And that's either you're a caregiver who provides product for free to one patient or you're an integrated dispensary license. And I think that there is somewhere in the middle where we can meet where we have these extremely talented craft cultivators who I've, I've spoken to so many of them, they want to help patients, they're willing to help patients. And if the infrastructure is there for them to lean on to help patients, they're gonna take advantage of it and they're gonna become a part of the system. We just have to give them some way to participate. Um, so that's where all of this came from. And I know it's not perfect and I know that it needs more discussion, but I think it is a, a way we can move um, to kind of come up with a solution to this problem of wanting caregivers to have access to more patients, wanting patients to have greater access to 
caregivers and to higher plant counts in a medicine that is clean and regulated um, without creating an unnecessary regulatory burden on moving back to the existing definition of a caregiver, I still firmly believe that a medical patient should be allowed to have three cultivating caregivers. So upping the ratio from one to three and caregivers should be able to have multiple patients. Now, I understand that having the security of clean, regulated, safe medicine is hard the more patients you give a caregiver. I understand that that's part of the problem here. So I don't know that it needs to be five patients per caregiver, but I think that one to three is fair and valid. I, it just, it's all about creating more affordable access to medicine. That's the bottom line. That's all we're trying to do. And I think like you guys all agree with that too. Um, so yeah, that's just where I am on that rant. Um, my other point was I actually was the one who proposed eliminating the uh, need to renew a medical card if you have a chronic illness. And I proposed that because I have multiple chronic illnesses, um, two of which are incurable. The, the language that needs to be changed, I think, and I understand what you're talking about, James, when you say that if we just allow a doctor to decide, doctors might just decide not to do it. I get that. I think the language change that could be made there is instead of having a list of conditions that qualify you for a card, a list of symptoms where if your condition falls within this list of symptoms, that qualifies you for a card. I think that makes more sense because we have things that cannabis are proven to alleviate the stress in symptoms of appetite, insomnia, pain. You know, we have these, these conditions. And the reason that we've singled out certain conditions is because they have these symptoms. So the reason that cancer patients are allowed access to cannabis is because it helps with appetite, insomnia, pain, you know? So I think that just kind of moving forward, a, a language change that we could make in the proposed regulation is instead of saying, allow a healthcare professional to provide a card for any condition is allow this set of, or allow any condition with this set of symptoms or with one of these symptoms to qualify you for a card. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's it for now. If I think of something else, I'll get in the queue at the end. Thanks, Amelia. <clears throat> uh, next, we have Ben Mervis. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, I just wanted to share some comments from the point of view of the retail experience. Um, you know, as as you all know, we, uh, my business partner Craig and I are interested in entering retail and also delivery. Um, and so just looking for clarification in, in along the way with regards to this idea of medical products versus adult use products and also hoping that medical patients will be able to purchase adult use products uh, and have the taxes waived on those products. Um, also in, in the same line of thinking, when we think about reciprocity, I will say it, it is one of those rising tides that raises all ships. Um, on a recent trip to Maine, I was with a friend who does have a medical card from Massachusetts. Maine provides reciprocity. Um, you know, we may not have even gone into a store if it weren't for that fact that my friend was able to purchase and have taxes waived. Um, and we even then separated our purchases, even though we could have had her purchase everything just out of fairness. Um, myself and another friend purchased of our own volition, paid our taxes to the state. And so the retailer was able to get three purchases, one untaxed, two taxed out of that, as opposed to what might have been zero purchases if reciprocity was not a factor there. Um, so that's just something that we hope for. And again, clarification on this idea of medical specific products, which I, I know there will be specific medical products, but we do believe medical patients should have access to the adult use products and have the taxes waived. And that's all I wanted to share today. Thank you so much for your work.
Thanks, Ben. Uh, next is Jeffrey Pizzatillo. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to say thank you uh, for adopting uh, some of our concepts and policies in this medical cannabis discussion. Not all, but some of them. Really appreciate it, especially around uh, access. Um, I want to point out uh, just two quick points. Uh, I would urge that for if you guys take a two-phase approach, um, I would urge you include an increased plant count in that phase one. Uh, I think that is vitally important. Um, we've been stuck with two plants since about 2009. Uh, so we are way past due. It is a top priority for the medical cannabis community. And I would just like to point out, we currently have Vermonters in the state getting arrested still, guys, for cultivating more than two plants. And some of them are registered patients and caregivers. Um, this is still currently going on albeit it's no longer maybe a top priority across the state, but I want you to be aware of this. And so it is a priority to increase the plant count. We are suggesting 10 mature plants uh, from the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, which includes Jesse Lynn Dolan at the Vermont Cannabis Nurses Association and Amelia, as you guys know. So that is uh, our recommendation. We would urge you to adopt that in phase one. My second point is uh, a couple months ago, uh, when you guys were having a medical cannabis discussion before the board, uh, there was talk about the uh, future oversight committee and uh, my organization was named. And I think you guys raised an excellent point, which was avoiding specifying, uh, enumerating a specific organization and entity in rule and statute. I would ask that you apply that to the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association. Uh, Please, uh, we urge you keep that standard for that you apply to grassroots trade associations and keep that and apply that consistently to the corporate trade association in the state, please. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, next is Tito Byrne. Hi, everybody. Um, so um, I, I like what Jeff was just talking about. And uh, also I have to, uh, second, what Kyle said earlier about the makeup of the medical board. The only member of this Vermont Cannabis Trades Association, as far as I know, is Champlain Valley Dispensary. Uh, and the biased decision making was glaringly clear at the subcommittee meeting that I attended. Um, but um, my main point um, that I, I really have to talk about is that I was really upset that I didn't hear anything on this whole meeting about the vape tax, uh, either from the Marijuana Symptom Relief Oversight Committee um, or the board. Um, this is a serious problem. We have to separate cannabis from tobacco. Uh, this legislation tries to muddy the water and include everything in uh, both, both things in this tax law. And it wasn't intended for cannabis. It's intended for tobacco vapes. Uh, we have to get some language separating these two things. Um, furthermore, right now, the current dispensaries are not required to pay the taxes on the same exact items that everyone else is required to pay the taxes on uh, for the exact same items. I mean, it just it just doesn't make sense. And then, you know, I asked the question, you know, will will future dispensaries in October, will they automatically be exempt from this tax? Um, uh, I just I, I, I got to hear some some more talk about it. Um, and I was disappointed to not hear anything. So that's all I just wanted to say that. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Tito. Next is Francis Janik. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me to speak today. Uh, first of all, I'll uh, second what Amelia said. I do think that we should go from three to five patients if we can. This allows somebody who's getting a license to actually have a small business so that they can charge a reasonable rate to patients but pay for their expenses. I think that if we expand that, then we will also increase the availability in this transition where you're concerned about availability for medical patients. Um, secondly, what you discussed today with removing fees for all registered patients, I think that's very important. Most of your patients here are low income, uh, as I had spoken to you before, myself included, I had dealt with that issue. 
So I don't see that when we can give away 300,000 here and 400,000 there from the medical program, as we have previously, that we should continue to charge patients in this manner. Now I've sent you guys um, a, a little bit of a, a note earlier today. And as I listen to the advice given today, I reflect on the history of our medical cannabis program, where Monique and Kalev opened Vermont Patient Alliance in Montpelier. I was glad to be there to share my experience and expertise in creating safe, effective, and affordable cannabis therapy products. A group of medical patient growers, including myself, advised on growing cannabis and taught the first grower how to make RSO for cancer patients and others with severe disease. Over the years, I've been informed by both employees of the integrated licensees and the patients who had chosen to rely on this limited system. Both groups have reported, and I have witnessed, extremely disturbing events. As I had informed you in a recent public comment meeting, there were documented instances of willful disregard for patient safety and violations of both MMJ rule, program rules and state and federal laws, including possible criminal action by principal officers of then Champlain Valley and Southern Vermont Wellness. All these, although these issues were reported to, by legislators to the Department of Public Safety in a timely manner, no action was taken to remove the licensees due to a lack of effective and affordable and most important safely, safe cannabis therapy products Small caregivers who share legally have become the backbone of our cannabis therapy program, serving far more patients than those who have cards. Some registered patients have gone as far as Canada and Maine to acquire needed cannabis therapy. I testified before House committees on this matter. It is my hope that we recognize the important contributions that small caregivers have and continue to provide in Vermont in need to Vermonters in need. So thank you for taking my comments today. Thank you. Next is Dave Silverman. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to go a little off topic. Um, I want to uh, give you some uh, very broad initial feedback on rules one and two that were that were released, um, and I'll keep this very high level. Uh, and you know, of course, we'll get you very detailed feedback in in the coming weeks. Um, this is based on um, initial discussions with some of my uh, cultivation clients. Um, I think that uh, a lot of what you've written, uh, specifically in uh, section 1.4 and section 2.2, the all of the individual things, you know, they make sense. I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, but when I take a step back, when my clients take a step back and look at the totality of what will be required. I think we're a really far cry away from what Kyle described when you guys were all on, on Vermont Edition as an application that could be done without consultants and lawyers. This isn't that. And um, there's just, in the aggregate, the burden will be very, very great. And I've already heard from clients saying, wow, I may just stay on the black market. And, and, and that's, uh, that's not what any of us want. Um, so I guess the, the feedback that I want you to, to take right now is that you, know, you have this 904A authority uh, to grant waivers uh, and exemptions and accommodations to the small growers, the, the tier one growers. And I would hope that while you're waiting for public comment and, and while you're waiting for this rulemaking process, you know, to kind of play out, that, that you each take a little bit of time and think about how it is that you can uh, exercise that 904A authority a little more aggressively so that um, this market can truly be welcoming to the folks that I know each one of you want to welcome into the market. Uh, so I'll leave it with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. And Amelia, I, I see your hand up. Um, we're trying to uh, limit the public comments to just one per person. Otherwise, this um, could just turn into a discussion among uh, people in the public. Um, but we do have a, if you could just either email um, Nellie or the board members your comment or put it through our 
portal. Um, we appreciate uh, you know all of the comments that we receive and consider them. So, um, if there's anyone that joined via the phone uh, and you'd like to make a public comment, please hit star six to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, then um, I don't have anything left on the agenda, and so I will uh, adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everyone, for for joining. Um, thank you, Julian Kyle.